squat, squat, squat. It's hard to say no to this. So we did this for a country. We love our country, all this we did with so much passion for our country. So much we, we loved our country, everything we sacrificed. We did for our country, we just love so much love for our country. And I want to make a big shout out to Squid Rugby. Please put this in your YouTube video. So let's go, vamos Chile. And indeed, it's hard to say no to South American rugby in general right now. Much as I feel for the USA and Canada as Major League Mojo was not enough to grant them a place in Paris, the sheer relentless passion of Uruguay and Chile made them so easy to shout for as the pair overcame the odds to put themselves in position for the 2023 Rugby World Cup. For those who haven't followed qualifying so far, last week, old channel favourites Uruguay became the 14th team to qualify for the World Cup in France as they stunned the USA in Montevideo after a great comeback the previous week to bring the aggregate down. This leaves the USA playing the winner of a desperate playoff between Canada and Chile, a team who have made every World Cup against a side who've never qualified. A game with a clear, clear favourite. A team the rugby gods say should, even will, win. And they didn't. Now, Chile beat a Georgia team boasting a Mamuka Gogodze so young you could still smell the nuclear radiation on them in 2004 and were within a kick of beating Argentina in 2000, but what happened last Saturday might be the biggest day Chilean rugby has ever had. Faced with a Canada team they've never beaten in a game to get them the closest to a World Cup they've ever been, player after player pulled the performance of their lives so far to pull off a spectacular win to give them now two chances to qualify for 2023. So, how did Chile pull off this historic win? The greatest in their history and uh, just how bad are things looking for Canada because I'm really sorry also I'm sorry for not covering the Uruguay USA game properly but vamos Terros and hopefully the USA can pull through that and I'm prepared to say now right like, this is a promise literally any international player who asks for a video in a broadcast post-match interview or maybe the biggest game of their life up until then gets their request granted I'll do that for anyone I think that's only fair there's an awful lot in common between Chile and Uruguay even once you look beyond the blood and guts pride and passion South American fever factor Chile's current run is extremely reminiscent of a certain set of powder blue powering back when they began their modern renaissance in 2014. And there is a reason for that. Just as Uruguay were when they qualified out of nowhere for the 2015 World Cup, the current Chile team is coached by Pablo Lemoyne. Seven years ago, Russia with a more fancied men in red standing between Lemoyne's team and a World Cup spot. Up against a quicker and yet more physical experience side, he had no choice but to really lean on inspired tactics. In the first leg, Uruguay deployed a very deliberate kicking game, looking to frustrate a very lively attacking Russian team, and played a very conservative defence, focused on stopping, not disrupting, and they held Russia to a two-point margin in the away leg. Russia expecting the same again, Uruguay shifted their tactics in the second leg. They then played far more ball in hand, resulting in glorious tries like this by Joaquin Prada, catching Russia unaware, and the defence became more aggressive, looking to press and pressure Russia. This worked, Lemoyne's team winning by nine points at home and taking the series on aggregate. And you know what they say, if it ain't broke, do the exact same thing seven years later with a different team. Chile deployed a near carbon copy of the tactics for the two test series. Canada got a bit of an upper hand as the game went on, but a superb kicking game kept Chile completely on top in the first half in particular. Fly half Rodrigo Fernandez, who sounds so much like a randomly generated South American 10 on Rugby Challenge, I can't believe he's real and not just a regen for the Argentina team that they haven't got licensed, has an incredibly accurate Gary Owen game and basically kicked a piss Canada off. It was reminiscent of the masterclass Russia's Ramil Geisen gave against Ireland, where he did the tactical equivalent of kicking Joe Schmidt's ball into a tree and going home for his tea while still chuckling. This kick is an easy mark for fullback Cooper Colts, but it traps him in such an awkward position to clear from. The touchlines are so far away, he's likely just giving Chile the ball back in Canada's own half against a more fractured defence. And in the second half, the distance on his boot kept Chile out of danger as Canada's attack and management started to pick up a bit. However, the superb kicking was team-wide. Locke, Clement Saavedra here spot space for the winger to chase, and Harry's to make the tackle himself, keeping the pressure really high. Modern kicking has become so much about the pressure, so much about being able to put a chase in and regain the ball. The benefits of the old school tactic of territory have been often largely forgotten. Chile made them dance. Compare this to how loosely Canada kicked in both tests. This is such a nothing kick. Too far for Canada to reach, but hung long enough to give Fernandez time to place his approach and break the line in the process. And what did he do from here? I mean, look at... <laughs> 
tell me you don't want to see this kind of shit in the World Cup? Come on, you can't, you, unless you're Canadian, in which case I completely understand, I'm really sorry, but oh, tell me you want to see this guy, this in the World Cup. Yes, please. The defence is also excellent as well, showcasing patience and discipline in how they mark the wide channels. The winger would look to man mark the biggest threat, whilst the players inside covered the space instead, drifting across the touchline in the spring box style. Here, teammates flying up allows our boy Martinez to make a great tackle himself, and here, drifting cover puts Canada into touch incredibly easily. If Chile do qualify, they'll find themselves in the pool with either England, Argentina and Japan, or Wales, Australia and Fiji, and this territory game won't work against teams with that kind of core skill and will to play, but Canada really struggled to do anything against it, especially when Chile tackled their tighter game so effectively with two man tackles. Sometimes it was both hitting hard to cost Canada meterage and momentum, sometimes it looked more like this, Captain Sigron flying in sideways between ball carrier and the support, meaning hooker Bohem can get over the ball and win the turnover, and true to Lemoyne, Chile changed attack between test one and two. After playing pressure rugby in the first, Chile became a side who ran it from behind their own post, under their own trial line in the second test. Canada adapted to try and tackle the threat they'd been faced in the first game with heavier backfield cover, but Lemoyne's team stayed one step ahead. It's a tribute to just how well round the 10 Fernandez is that they can shift tactics. And he suddenly looks like a completely different rugby player, a completely different guy using his sevens background to run and big angles like this. And he's someone who never dies with the ball, looking for broken field opportunities to just here, creating a try for Santiago Videa. However, it wasn't just Fernandez. The whole team bought into this change, something we see perfectly in the first passage of play. Escobar evades tacklers like his namesake, taxes for a good bust, and then Torre Alba sets to kick. Chile have played territory last week, Canada's backfield set deep, and it leaves this empty space which Torre Alba targets accurately. Nobody can get to it, the ball bounces, and Domingo Saavedra absolutely nails Canada talisman Tyler Aldron, allowing our hero Martinez to make the turnover. Chile then pick and go. This formed the basis of Chile's primary strategy. The previous game, Canada ran what I'm going to call to be kind a very old-fashioned defensive tactic, where the guard, the first guy of the ruck here, looks to apply pressure while someone from the other side of the ruck folds round to fill the gap. Now, teams stopped doing this about the time of Kingsley Jones side last week won something. For the precise reason, it's so exploitable. The defender is constantly on the lookout for both what's coming next and trying to make the tackle themselves, and this draws them out of place. The next defender is never able to make up the space in time, meaning, for example here, Chile can fire Fernandez right through the gap. Clean as anything, it's really quite easy for a modern team. The first defender is always eyeing up their options, meaning they can't watch the ruckers closely, and Chile picked and went through it time and time again, constantly targeting the area either side, knowing they could cause chaos. Or, as here, once Gareth Hewlett brings the ball back in during that first passage, Canada start to condense. Eight players are within three metres of this ruck, really aware of what Chile are doing, so they spread it wide, and then they do the exact same thing on the other end of the pitch. The Canadian forwards are all back around the previous ruck, and it's even easier to make ground against just backs and the eternally working Ardron, the Chilean pack working hard to get into place to carry. To break things up a little bit, Chile adopt the pattern we saw England play the Six Nations, where the forwards start behind the ruck, then run round as the ball is ready, meaning they pick their lines late and the opposition can't line them up in time. Here, Roland tries to predict it and open up space for Tori Alba, who offloads, attacking around the ruck, runs the risk of this, however, Ardron getting over the ball and winning the penalty, but it also smashed them from their own 22 into the oppositions through using a really basic tactic but executed well. This became a huge point of difference. Chile felt on top pretty much all game because they carried smarter and harder. This is almost superb. Gareth Fulick runs an obvious tight angle and Rumble steps in to tackle him. But Bomi has hidden himself behind these other forwards and winger Valadra further back. Bohem's angle forces Thomas in, opening this huge hole as the winger can take the offload. Chile's attack isn't totally cutting edge, but they've imbued it with enough slickness and subtlety to tear apart defence that is, at best, at kindest, from 2017. I know for a fact, right, that teams in Midlands Division 2 in England were being coached to stop doing this three years ago. So seeing a team who qualified to every Rugby World Cup be so far behind the times is kind of extraordinary, and Chile spotted that, exploited that, and scored plenty of tries as a result. And it's a kind of subtlety that Canada weren't able to deploy. They were frankly the worst team with the ball in 2019, a blunt updated attack, without the test calibre kicking game of fellow Minas Russia and Namibia, but things have improved in that area since Rob Howley's arrival. The only problem is they aren't executing the more advanced advanced attack patterns he's introduced. How do you want them running with deception, giving the defence many men to try and watch to create confusion? But instead, only the attack is being baffled, constantly getting in each other's way. And here lies Canada's problem. 
This is a team who don't get time together, a team with endless logistical and practical difficulties, and the patterns they're running are all under-rehearsed. There are many, many deep problems with Rugby Canada and Rugby in Canada, and they've left the team in absolute freefall, finding themselves further behind at halftime to Chile in 2021 than they were to France in 2015 in the World Cup. As someone who wants rugby to remain just a thing in Canada and like it to just exist, we've got to get behind the women's side to do well in New Zealand next year to keep the organisation and spirits ticking over as they dream of a potential World Cup expansion in 2027, which is something Chile themselves will be very excited about. This is now the closest they've ever been to qualifying, and they've done it with an incredibly young team. The average age of this side is just 24, and their oldest player, tired prop and the world's largest suitcase, Matthias Ditus, is just 28. This entire squad will be around for the next World Cup, and they can only get better from here. There's a sparsity of caps, but it doesn't show. Instant channel icon Martinez is just 21, winning his third cap, but played with the instincts of a 40-cap veteran, always on hand and never able to tire. And if I were a pro team somewhere in Europe, I'd be having a look at both of their locks, Workhorse, Javier Eisman, and particularly Clement Saavedra, a huge slab of human who plays like something from a battery advert, always powered up and smashing anything he sees. His twin brother, Domingo, is also a very for 13, a kind of extra flanker, hard-running, defensive rock type centre, who is a beard away from me wondering whether it's a Latin reincarnation of David Casharava. There's lots for them to work on. The World Cup will be a huge step up in intensity, and chances like this need to be put away to beat the USA. Players not spotting an enormous overlap with Canada slow to retreat. But the way Chile are going, the direction they're headed, they won't need shout-outs soon to catch the world's eye. But even more so, if they continue playing the way they're playing, showing the passion they're showing, winning the friends and fans they are, Mr. Raimundo Martinez won't be the only player desperately in love with that country very soon. Thank you for watching that. I hope you very much enjoyed it. Thank you particularly to Raimundo Martinez himself. There was no way I couldn't make this video the moment I saw that. Um, I am still working on the video on the Australia team and how they've kind of rebirthed. I'm going to hope to have that up in the next weekish. So that's coming. Um, there's far more coming as well. The podcast is, of course, back right now, today. If anyone wants to go and listen to our first episode of 1987, uh, the first game between New Zealand and Italy is up and available now. If you want to go and listen to that, that would be wonderful. So, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone that supports them on Patreon. And I'll see you sometime in the next week for some stuff on, like, Marika Corobetti and Dave Rennie and that. And on the evidence of what we've seen, well, those joyous scenes, that emotion, if they can bottle it and carry it, we may well see that team in red, led by the Uruguayan Pablo Limone, at the Rugby World Cup Finals. It's been a big day for Chilean rugby. It'll be a long night, you feel, in Valparaiso. Chile, march on, Canada, bow out.